As always, it's a great privilege to be offered the opportunity to stand before you. Throughout his time on earth, mankind has made quite a few mistakes. Whether it's directly sin or poor judgment based on ignorance or simply lack of wisdom, it would behoove us to learn from those mistakes, whether it be ours personally or the mistakes of others. In fact, one reason that the history course is taught in school is so we can do just that, to look at our past, consider those actions and even the results, and to learn from them. Well, God has given a man, God has given man in general a book which contains inspired history from which man is expected to learn. We see this in Romans 15, verse 4, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. Now in this book, man can learn, and is expected to learn, that God is displeased when His people substitute His way for their own. We can learn that when a substitution takes place, there is punishment that will follow. We see in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, the account of Cain and Abel, as well as Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, where Nadab and Abihu were, were punished for their unauthorized worship. Whenever God gives direction to His people, He expects those people not to deviate from that plan. He expects there not to be a substitution or alternative made. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 6, and Revelation 22, verses 18 through 19. Now we will find a failure similar to this throughout the life of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So our text this morning is found in 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 25 through 33. Now in this account, we see where King Jeroboam made substitutions. He made them for the people, and they were sinful. Now we will consider his mistakes by examining four of the substitutions of Jeroboam. So our text, 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 25 through 33. A little bit of a lengthy reading, but I feel it necessary to to immerse ourselves in the context and uh, to get an idea of what God wants us to learn from this passage. Verse 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out from thence and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to the due sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me, and do again, or go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel, and made two calves of gold, and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And he made an house of high places, and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar, so did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel, the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised in his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. And he offered upon the idol, the altar, and burnt incense. So our first substitution we want to consider is Jeroboam substituted the place of worship. You see, God prescribed that Jerusalem was Israel's place of worship. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 5 through 14, and 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 32. 
Now you see at this time, the kingdom was divided. And the city of Jerusalem rested on the border of Judah and Benjamin. So naturally it would fall as being part of the kingdom of Judah at this time in Israel's history. So you see Jeroboam's reasoning. It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. So this is out of convenience. So we see, as we just read, that Jeroboam built Dan or altars in Dan and Bethel out of convenience. Thus Israel had two substitute places of worship. Mankind can provide substitutes for the place of worship today. He does this by departing God's word, and thus doing will lead to many substitutions. We see denominationalism. We see various cults and spiritualism. Now, we're not going to go through all those that are under those categories, but certainly you can understand that there are very many bodies out there that are substitutes for places of worship as ordained by God. Now, from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, particularly from the American Standard Version, 1901, God has set eternity in our hearts. Throughout history, you can see that mankind has had the inherent desire to worship something higher than himself. Now, it might be some gods of the pantheon, whether in ancient Greece or Rome, or even ancient Egypt, they had a whole host of gods. Or ancient Mesopotamia, Assyria, and on the list goes. Man has also had the desire for a social atmosphere. Man is a social being. Man has also had the desire to meet humanitarian goals. goals. Thus, man desires to make substitutions for what God has ordained. Such examples would be the Salvation Army, different Masonic lodges. Both of these and everything related to them are substitutions for God's appointed place of worship. In the New Testament age, which we're under, God's appointed place of worship is the church. But there's only one church. It is that church that Christ built and shed his blood for. Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 through 18. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. There is no other church. It is in the church that man is to glorify God. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21. This body of the saved is where all spiritual blessings and the saved are. There's no other place for these spiritual blessings. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 23 through 27. Acts chapter 2 verse 47. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13. Corporate worship is therefore to take place in the public assembly of the church. What we're doing right now. This is a public assembly. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 18 through 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, and Acts chapter 20, verse 7. So we ask the question, why would anyone want to forsake such an assembly for any alternative? We find in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 26, the writer there says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us therefore hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works." not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the faith, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. You see, those of the world, they at least have their ignorance to hide behind. 
though they themselves will be accountable for God for their actions in the flesh. But those of the church, those who have, as it says, had their, their consciences sprinkled and been washed with the pure water, well, that references baptism. Those who have entered the church or being added to it by their Savior through baptism, there is no sacrifice for sins if they depart from the faith. They know better, but have chosen not to, to do better. So we as Christians can substitute the church for anything else, whether it be sitting at home doing nothing, relaxing because we had a long work week. On and on the list can go. Just the same for those of the world who have made different, sub, or different places of worship. You consider the Catholic Church, the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church. Each of these churches are made by men. And they belong to those men. You look at the community churches nowadays. That seems to be the, the hot rage is everybody wants to go to a community church because they don't really say anything that's worthwhile. There is no real doctrine. It's all milk toast talk. Well, folks, Christ did not die for any substitute. Any substitute. Christ died but for one church. We must be added to it. And we must be faithful to his will. Our second substitute. In verses 33 and 34 of 1 Kings, uh, as well as 31 of chapter 12 of 1 Kings, we see that Jeroboam provided a substitute priesthood. God prescribed those who would serve him in the priesthood. We find that Aaron's sons were to be the high priests and the other Levite families would perform the various duties around the temple. This was the pattern. We see this in Numbers chapter 4 as well as Numbers chapter 18 verses 1 through 7. But you see, to accommodate his place of worship, substitute place of worship out of convenience, naturally you'd have to have priests. So Jeroboam installed anyone who wanted to be a priest. 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 33. This substitution was a sin. And it's the same sin if we allow that to take place today. 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 34. Denominationalism employs a similar tactic. You see the, the clergy laity system in Catholicism, the pastor system in most denominations, and each of these systems, if you will, have the same idea that you must pray through the priests in order to re receive your own salvation. In preparing for this lesson, I looked up online what it would take to become a, a priest. And, uh, of course, you have to have some type of degree in philosophy. Didn't, didn't really say what. They requested Bible. <clears throat> but what I found most interesting, and I guess it's mainly funny, the iconic shirt and that little white collar. You got to have one of those to be a priest, right? Well, there's a there's a website where you can get one shirt for forty one dollars, two, and you get free shipping. The collar comes with it. That's a, a big qualification to be a priest nowadays, and has been for quite some time, I would assume, because every time you see these priests, priests so called, they've got this little garb on. It's got a nice button-up shirt with her white collar across the front. Is this really what God expects from his priests? We know from the New Testament that each and every Christian is a priest. Revelation 5, verses 9 through 10. Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 through 6, which reads, And from Christ Jesus, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And also 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But ye are a, cho a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, 
that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Thus, every Christian has the privilege as an individual to offer sacrifices to God. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, and 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Going along with that, we must not make substitutions in church government. Elders are to oversee the individual congregation. These men are called pastors, bishops, and presbyters. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, and James chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. This task does not fall to the preacher. This task does not call to the men they call pastors. They're not elders. They're just a man that's attempting to make substitutions for God. This is the pattern. Many try to have the preacher evangelize on their behalf. This is another substitution that we ourselves can make today. After all, our contribution goes to paying the preacher. Seems like he should, you know, do his job and preach on my behalf. At least that's the thinking of some and really even many. But we see that the Great Commission was not given to the preacher. It was given to each individual member. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. And Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 and through 40, uh, 14 through 16. Each of us, as members of the blood-bought body of Christ, are priests. As such, we are individually expected to teach the gospel by, in our various capacities. We must not fall into the same trap of substitution as Jeroboam did. We must instead appreciate the obligations and responsibilities laid to our charge by God the Father, as established and outlined in His Word. Our third subs substitution. This is the person, a person of worship. We see in verse 28 and 29 of 1 Kings 12, that Jeroboam provided a substitute person of worship. We see that he made two golden calves. One he put at Dan, the other he put at Bethel. Again, out of convenience for his people. Now we see what this would eventually lead to, and that is worship of Baal. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. Eventually, Israel would be slaves to materialism. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 13. But you see, Jeroboam did not understand his history, did not know his history. Maybe he didn't care to know it. Either way, he fell into the same trap as Aaron with his folly on the golden calf. There in Exodus chapter 32 verses 4 through 8. We see the punishment of that. It came from Moses and God. There and still in Exodus chapter 32 but verses 19 and 20 as well as verse 35. It says, And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. And he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. And in verse 35, And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf, which Aaron made. So this points out that the great responsibility that a leader has over his people. If the leader sins, it's more than likely going to follow that the people will sin. Now the people has the individual expectation to remain faithful to God. But it's far easier when your leadership is flawed and corrupted and making these idols, it's far, far easier to, to go into sin when your leadership does. We must guard ourselves. We know from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 5, that Jehovah God is the person of worship, true worship. 
Man must never substitute the person of worship. We as mere mortals must worship and serve the Creator rather than the creature. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. And Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 25. Every attempt to make a substitute person of worship will fail. Materialism will fail. Luke chapter 12, <clears throat> verses 20 and 21. Trusting in, in oneself to guide you will fail. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26. And Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 25. Humanism will fail. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 16 through 19. And ultimately, idolatry will fail. Very similar to materialism. Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 34. We see there on Mars Hill where Paul was debating these people, calling into question their superstitions, and he presented the truth to them. You think that's any different from the world we live in now? It might not be idols of silver, but maybe it's taking the form of an Apple or Android, what they call a smartphone. You know, that can be an idol. Anything we put in place of God is our idol. Whether it's the almighty dollar, as we often say, whether it's in the individual self and humanism, it could be anything. Anything that takes the place of God in our lives is our own idol. And that substitution will not stand. Only correctly worshiping God will end in success. John chapter 4, verse 24. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9. Now we see our fourth substitution. 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 32 and 33, we see that Jeroboam provided a substitute pattern of worship. You see how this goes? It's the logical progression of sin. We see that Jeroboam offered himself unauthorized worship. He offered incense on the altar at Bethel, and he even ordained a new feast day for Israel. God had already ordained laws for religious festivals, Leviticus chapter 23, and he demanded strict adherence to this pattern of worship. Exodus chapter 25, verse 9 and 40, Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 10, and Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The New Testament shows God's pattern for us today for worship. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 5 through 6. God's people are to gather on the first day of the week. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. On this first day of the week, the Lord's Day, the first century Christians partook of the Lord's Supper. They partook of the bread which represents the body of their Savior. They partook of the fruit of the vine, which represents his blood. Now, as with everything, people seem to want to make substitutions. For these emblems, they might substitute bread that would not be unleavened. They might even use alcohol in substitution for the fruit of the vine. Some might even partake or substitute the frequency of partaking. <clears throat> it is often seen that some would take it quarterly, some would even take it yearly, and even some denominations and cults take the, what they call the Lord's Supper every time they gather, whether it be for a funeral, what they call mass, and weddings. Some would even substitute taking the Lord's Supper if they aren't able to go to the, the assembly of the first day of the week, would take it at home. You don't see that pattern in the New Testament. The assembly takes it, not the individual at home. These substitutions are dangerous. We see the Lord's church is supported by free will offerings, just like the priests of old under the, the Old, uh, Old Testament doctrine. The priests were supported through the sacrifices. They were to offer sacrifices to God first. The remainder went to them. <clears throat> 
that were that was their pay, if you will. After all, they were not able to work because they were tending to the needs of the temple, high priests and the others. Each member is expected to offer this free will offering on the first day of the week. Well, we might have money to go buy some gaming system at the Target or Walmart. We might be able to go out to eat, say, Steamboat, Steakhouse over on Beltway 8. What about setting money aside for God? If we are indeed going to render our bodies as a living sacrifice, it's not supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be a sacrifice. We're giving something up, not just giving God the scraps. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6, and 6 through 7. Some wish to substitute how this money is offered. They might have a, a church-funded or church-organized car wash. You see that going on even, even in the cold weather. Folks have no shame. You might have a fish fry. Folks catch all these fish, and we start selling plates of fried fish so we can con contribution. All this goes to God as the church. The church might hold bingo night or other various forms of gambling. You can't be engaged in sin, even though the outcome might be useful and still be pleasing to God. But many indeed try to do that. Now there's nothing wrong with the individual, say selling a portion of property, like Ananias and Sapphira. They as an individual, or really individuals, members of the church, sold property. And they gave a portion of that to God, or they gave, it, they gave it back to God. Now, they lied about what they gave back and were punished accordingly. But if the individual comes into a large amount of money, they have every right to give a portion of those goods, even all those goods. After all, where do our blessings come from, if not God? And everything we, we give to Him is not anything other than returning those blessings to Him. <clears throat> the Lord's church is expected to gather on the first day of the week to engage in worship and song. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. We see that these consist of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. This is done by speaking. You're using words. The instrument outlined is the heart. Now some wish and have been making substitutions for this act of worship. They might sing and hum. They might sing and clap. They might even attempt and even use mechanical instruments in that period of worship. <clears throat> One thing I think is becoming more prevalent is using voice mimicking mechanical instruments. There are several music bands that do this. They will, they will use their voice to mimic either drums or guitars or really whatever they want, and that's quite a phenomenal thing to do, but not in the assembly of worship. You see, even though we're using our voice, we're still mimicking a mechanical instrument. That is not authorized by God in the New Testament. At that point, you're basically using a mechanical instrument. You're not plucking the harp strings which is what God demands from that church that Jesus bought with his blood. God has commanded verbal communication in these songs. A drum set will not do that. You can drop the bass, you can bang on that drum all you want. In the period of worship, that's unacceptable to God. Going beyond anything that is authorized is an act of sin. Now, we might not realize that. We might not care in, this, in the life of the flesh. But on Judgment Day, we're going to have to give an account for that. The Lord's church is also to pray in the worship assembly. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Now, this ought to be done with reverence for God. Acts chapter 16, verse 13. It ought to be done with gratitude. Matthew chapter 15, verse 36. And those praying <clears throat> are to do so, to ask in faith. Matthew chapter 21, verse 32, 22. 
We are to pray according to the Lord's will. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. Any type of substitute, again, is sin. Removing any of these attributes, these aspects of prayer, results in a substitute for prayer, a sinful prayer. <clears throat> the Lord's church is also expected to gather for worship, for preaching, for teaching of, the God, of, of God's will. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. The only thing that will cause a Christian to grow is the very word of God. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. From this preaching, each individual is expected to be able to, to get a better understanding of God's wisdom. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. Preaching here must bring maturity to the hearers. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 through 11. Now going along with that, what kind of hearers are we when the lesson is being brought? Are we out in the back just staring into blank space? We have our Bibles open, but maybe we're doodling and we're not paying attention. I realize drawing pictures is a, a teaching method. I myself, you know, I can't draw, so I don't do it. But I understand needing helps to listen. But when it takes place of listening, that's where the problem lies. Maybe we're passing notes to folks. Could just be staring into blank space like we just said. What kind of a hearer are we? Are we ready to receive the engrafted word which is able to save our souls? Being good listeners is a requirement for this act of worship. Now, substitutions we might see would be substituting doctrine for emotions. Or, I think so, rather than thus saith the Lord. Some would teach a perverted gospel. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. The problem with a perverted gospel, it will never be able to save anyone. It cannot save. So as we've seen this morning, these four substitutions of Jeroboam, his religion that he installed was a religion of substitution. And it was a religion of sin. He might have had good intentions because, well, you know, it, it might be too difficult to go up to Jerusalem. Now, he actually had ulterior motives. But again, pointing out to the sacrifice aspect of worship. I should be willing to sacrifice my time, maybe my fuel going into the car to drive to this building on the first day of the week. That is expected of me. It's reasonable. Same as was expected of the children of Israel of old. In order for men to be pleasing to God, we must follow God's pattern for worship. There is no way around that. James chapter 1 verse 22. We must never make substitutions. Rather, we should cling to and earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to mankind. Jude chapter verse 3. Just as there was a pattern for the topics we've just discussed... There's a pattern for becoming qualified in order to offer that worship acceptable to your creator, our creator, God Almighty. Well, that, potter, that pattern is simply hearing the gospel, Romans 10, 17, growing your faith based on that gospel, John 8, 24, repenting of your past sins, Acts 3, 19, confessing Christ before others, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, and finally being baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts 22 verse, six, uh, verse 16. You see the catechism and strict adherence to that book will make a Catholic. The Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, their material is going to result in a Mormon. The New World Translation and all their various materials will make eventually a Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness. But the Bible and the Bible alone will make a Christian and only a Christian. There is no hyphenated Christian. You're simply a Christian, a child of God. You've undergone the, the new birth, John chapter 3, and you're now a child of God. You're now dedicated to service of God. Now that Bible, <clears throat> particularly the New Testament, provides the removal of sin once the child of God has erred. 
a pattern for sin removal. <clears throat> James chapter 5, verse 16, and 1 John chapter 1, 7 through 10. If you need to become a Christian this morning, take the time to do so. Or if you are a child of God already, but you've allowed sin to creep back into your life, make the steps today to correct those things. Whatever the need may be, please make it known as together we stand and sing.